Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Femininja Project. And as always, I have a fantastic guest with me today. He might be a little bit controversial for some people, so I'm just giving you that little, you know, public service announcement, but he's a fascinating man. He's on a mission, and it is an honor to have him on the show. His name is George, and he is a blogger and advocate who is widening perspectives around men. He shares uncomfortable conversations and ugly truths that others don't want to talk about, along with the unpopular other half of gender equality and men's mental health. George, thank you so much for being here and welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks for having me. It's always interesting to hear the different disclaimers I have before I'm introduced. Like, oh, don't don't be don't be scared. It's okay. And I mean, I hope at the end of this podcast, people can agree that what I'm going to say is entirely uncontroversial mm-hmm. and something that we we should be speaking about a lot more. But thank you. Nice to be here. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's nice to have you from across the pond. And yeah, that's one of the reasons why I love having men on the show. I love to hear a man's perspective. I love for them to share their stories um, and hear their voices. And with all of the man bashing that is going on in our society, I think it's absolutely terrible. And I also think that for me, if I were to hop on that bandwagon, it just, to me, would be incredibly disrespectful to the many, as I call them, the many magnificent men in my life. I, you know, I've got a great husband. I had a wonderful father. Um, and I wouldn't be here today with all of these lovely tools and toys behind me if it weren't for the men at the dojo who really helped me get here. Well, perfect. I mean, I can, I'm happy to say the same about my my girlfriend and my my mom and the women in my life are all my my experience of women for my entire life has been overwhelmingly positive. The vast majority of women I meet have been wonderful, brilliant role models to me. Like mm-hmm. My mum my is probably my biggest role model. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the things I talk about on my page are sort of influenced by her political viewpoint and her way of talking about and seeing the world. And I, I wouldn't be here or I wouldn't be here in the way that I am if it weren't for the women in my life. And I'm more than happy to say that. Same for men. Like the vast majority of men are wonderful. And uh, I've got mm-hmm. plenty of role models in that sense too. So with my perspective on the opposite sex and your perspective on the opposite sex, how in the world did we get here where, you know, that to, where this everything is toxic masculinity <laughs> and, you know, an alpha male is something to be, you know, despised? Mm. Well, I mean, we're, we're sort of surrounded by terms that mean mean very little. Toxic masculinity, as an example, it sort of doesn't really have much substance to it. I know there's been research that have looked into studies of so-called toxic masculinity, and they find that in the majority of such studies, the, the concept's not even established. We don't even know what it is. I've seen toxic masculinity blamed for climate change. I've seen I've seen it blamed for Brexit. I've seen it blamed for gang gang crime. I've seen it blamed for like men not recycling. I've seen it blamed for the ozone layer depletion, climate change, and uh, the financial crash, and Donald Trump being elected. And I'm like, it boggles my mind how the same thing could be causing so many disparate and entirely unrelated problems. And often I find toxic masculinity as a concept is really just about signaling disapproval of men. That's really what it's about. Um, now people try and dress it up with some sort of science, but I'm I'm not particularly convinced. Um, but I don't know where the man bashing comes from personally. I do, I mean, one of my fundamental beliefs on my page is that no one is born bad um, apart from perhaps a very small majority, very small minority of people, but the vast majority of people are not born bad. And I, I encourage people not to see men as a sort of static object, like an end product, like a violent man or a toxic man. I try to see them as the end product of a lifetime of experiences, some good, some bad, um, some very painful, and that we are all the product of our experiences, even the bad men we don't like. So I encourage people to look behind the toxic man or the violent man and ask yourself what sort of experiences he been on that have mm-hmm. shaped in this way. So I guess extending that same philosophy to a lot of them being women, to the women that bash men, I also mm-hmm. like to ask what is behind the women that bash men so openly that have shaped their perspectives of men to be so bad. And, and often I find they've experienced traumatic or painful things at the hands of men which are very valid and we should talk about them. And the, the people that bash men, I'm trying to say, they're not born bad either. They've had experiences too. And mm-hmm. we should give them the same sort of um, goodwill 
and see them in the same depth as I ask those people to see men. So it goes both ways. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. And since you mentioned that it goes both ways, I mean, there is such a thing as, you know, a violent woman. Of course, mm. women aren't known for being, you know, violent, but, you know, there there is a certain small percentage that could fall into that category. And by violent, um, probably different in the way that men are. And I think you had something it was on your Instagram account. I can't remember. I took, oh yeah, relational relational aggression. And that's what I really picked up on that. So women are a little bit, I mean, our approach to aggression is different from a man's. Mm. A bit more sophisticated, perhaps. I'm so glad you had to look down at your notes to see what the word relational aggression was, because it just shows me how few people know what it is. But relational aggression is basically... Um, when you you basically attack someone's status or relationships um, as a means of sort of bringing them down. So mm -hmm. gossiping, spreading rumors, telling lies, passing around doctored photographs, excluding people from social events, you know, gossiping groups, whispering campaigns, the secret WhatsApp group that you don't know about. That is the type of aggression that women more often perpetuate and mostly towards other women. Like anyone, I mean, I don't even have to tell you this. I mean, most women know what it's like to be bullied by other women and it is horrific. I've, I mean, I've been bullied by both women and men. So I can, I mean, I can talk about it equally. And often in childhood, especially the boys in school, they come up and just punch you or hit you or kick you or push you over, which is not particularly nice. But often when the girls or women have bullied me, it's sort of a bit more behind the scenes. It's sort of, like you say, just picking away your self-esteem, uh, spreading rumors, gossiping about you, mm -hmm. talking about you behind your back. That's relational aggression. Of course, men can do that too. And women, as you say, can be physically violent, but normally mm -hmm. it splits like that. Um, it's almost like yeah. it's harder though to fight against or to protect yourself against that type of um, subversive type of aggression, mm. because it is, yeah. it's not something that you can pinpoint and say, well, you know, Joe punched me in the face. That's, mm. you know, but you can't complain about, well, so-and-so is talking about me or, you know, cutting me off from mm. other people, you know, but it is, it's a completely different situation. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, it's, it's, I've been trying to get people to stop using the word, like people in the UK at least say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like words, words sometimes hurt more than sticks and stones, mm -hmm. like especially words from a loved one. And I just think that's such a naive take. And you are right. It's very, it's not as tangible. Like someone punches you, you get a bruise, you hate that person, and then you know you heal. And there's also there is a psychological pain with that. But to have someone malevolently undo you or attack your status or push your friends away from you or alienate you or gaslight you, it's very difficult to notice. It's sort of very unshapely and abstract. And I feel like it's it's interesting because men in general have a greater physical strength over women, like both in terms of physical strength and stamina. And it makes sense that men, malevolent men, bad men would make use of that physical advantage to harm other men. But then in that post I talked about earlier, women have always been the innovators of language. They are the coalition builders in chief. They are the ultimate in terms of relationship building. They're more in general emotionally eloquent than men are. So in the same way that a man would take advantage of his physical prowess, it makes sense for bad women to, to take advantage of their dominion over relationships and language and to use that to hurt others. And mostly it hurts girls. And it's wor it's even worse now because obviously of social media, girls can bully other girls 24 seven with complete wow. anonymity. And there's no, there's no way of finding out who's doing it. And a lot of people, Jonathan Hay talks about, for example, that that could be dr driving the spike in suicide in young girls in America because the, the bullying is just out of control and you can't get away. So what we talked about boys, the tangible punching, at least when you leave school, you can go home and you're not going to, you can get away from it. But I suppose as long as you've got one of these, a phone, you, you're you vulnerable to the relational aggression side. And that, that's a massive problem, especially for young girls. Well, and I, I'm, I can say this because I am a woman. Um, girls can be incredibly vicious. Yeah. Horrible. and vindictive I, I have four sisters and i'm not saying that they are um but you could imagine when we were growing up and of course thank goodness this was way before social media we used to have things that were like physical things like you know slam books and and that type mm. of thing but um it, it it's amazing that what we each experienced as we were going through especially middle school and high school it was absolutely cutthroat mm. and these are people who were supposed to be my friends 
Mm. Yeah, I have a friend whose daughter is about 14 now, and I am, it's blown away, like devastating what happens to her, like being left out of like, left behind at a party recently, and her friends are sending photos of the party that she's not invited to. And I, it breaks my heart just looking at it. So to be her, I'm like, that is horrific. I'd rather be punched, I think, than that. That is heartbreaking and like really quite sophisticated, well thought out bullying. And uh, it's horrible, really, really horrible. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, uh, I have experienced extreme severe physical pain in my life, and I have experienced extreme severe mm. emotional pain in my life, and I'll take the physical pain any day. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's just easier to quantify in a way the way you explained, and um, and it's easier is... to heal from, I think. Mm. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, and it's easy to blame the other person. Whereas with the the more manipulative side, you sort of blame yourself. You don't quite understand. You doubt yourself. Is it happening? Is it not? Like I get it all the time. Of course, a lot of things I speak about are very controversial. And there are a lot of women and men that don't like me and don't want me speaking about the things I talk about. And some people come into my mess, send me messages that are, you know, quite explicit and aggressive and that's fine. But then there was other people that just start whispering campaigns about me and they mass report my content and they send it around and they gossip about it. And I definitely prefer option A. I definitely prefer like an upfront confrontation. Call me at, you know, X, Y, Z or whatever you want. But the people that go away and silently talk about me and spread rumors about me, uh, that hurts me the most, I think. Yeah. But that is the true definition of a bully is they Mm. do not want to face the person because if they got called out, I mean, bullies Mm. are cowards Mm. and it's so easy to hide behind that screen. And you said it beautifully, just, you know, why suicide uh, rates in young girls in the United States is just, you know, going off the charts. And even with, Mm. you know, young men too, it's so easy to hide behind that screen and to say things about people that they would never have the courage to say to them to their face all the people that i know that hate me i've i've sent them a d of which there are quite a few i've sent them all messages like politely saying i understand you don't like me or you don't agree with what i'm saying would you like to have a conversation a bit like what we're doing now and no one's responded with yes no one's ever responded with yes and uh i'm like that is just gutless and i mean i've, I've had friends i've had friends i've lost plenty of friends now and wow. a lot of people, a lot of my old friends don't like what I'm saying. And I know, I'm like, I've said, I've said, like, I know you don't like what I'm saying. Can you be specific about what I'm saying that you don't like? Well, B, are you open to having a conversation about why you don't like it? Mm-hmm. And they, they don't know. They say no. They don't really have an example of what it is they don't like. They just don't like the idea of what I'm doing. And I'm like, that is gutless too. And uh, I, I'm very much of the believer that if you have a problem with someone, you should tell them. Mm-hmm. And I feel that person who you're talking to will appreciate that more as well. And mo- overall, it has a much more productive, benef- um, beneficial outcome. Mm-hmm. You know, well, I, I'm I'm actually almost uh, at a loss for words. I'm almost mm. thunderstruck, which usually doesn't happen very often in my <laughs> life. But it it just goes to 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 show you that if you invite them to have a conversation, they pr- and they don't you know, you hear crickets, nobody takes you up on it. They must know at some level that what they're saying, they cannot defend, or they cannot no. even explain it in a way that would make make some sort of sense. No. Well, I mean, often at that point, when they can't contend with the ideas, they will start attacking you personally. They'll make ad hominem attacks, and they'll just make fun of you, and they'll call you a, an incel or a virgin or a misogynist or whatever else. And like, I don't, I just simply do not understand, especially the accusation of misogyny, because what I'm talking about, what we've been talking about in this conversation, we're just realizing the full gamut of fe- women's behavior. We're, what, what we're talking about is women's autonomy, like the, the autonomy to do harm to others, including girls. Mm-hmm. And like, I I'm truly believe that uh, women are fundamentally human beings and they're capable of both saintly and demonic behavior. They're mm-hmm. capable of greatness and huge amounts of harm. They're no better or worse than men. Mm-hmm. And that is not misogynistic. I feel like people that pretend that women are just this benevolent, beautiful, saintly, pure being that can't do anything bad. That is what I think is misogyny because you're just rounding women off. You're just making them, you're basically making them the sort of the Cinderella again. Mm-hmm. Whereas I'm like, no, women women are can do amazing things and mm-hmm. extremely harmful things. And whichever those routes that woman goes down is her choice. And that is what autonomy is. 
So I fully reject it's misogynistic. I feel like it's actually in a way part of women's empowerment to recognize they can cause great harm. Mm -hmm. And we should be talking about that because the harm is done not just to men, but to women and girls too. Well, and putting people in a box like that, whether it's men or women or, you know, according to um, you know, religion, race, whatever it is, you're mm. separating them and like keeping people apart. And once you start separating them and putting labels on us or, you know, in certain boxes or whatever, then we don't communicate with each other. And then we start no. to have those feelings of maybe animosity toward another group that really are completely invalid. No, any it's called othering. That is where you basically it's you versus the other, and that and that goes for all walks of life. Politically speaking, it's always mm -hmm. team A versus team B, red team versus blue team, and it's not about it's not necessarily about advocating for your cause. It's about defeating the other side at any cost, and it's never really about taking accountability for other members of your group. It's a bit like sports. A sports team. This team I support in the UK is. Uh, did a really Leicester City basically they won the Premier League a few years ago and it was excellent mm -hmm. and I was a big fan and now they've been relegated and I'm still a fan and that's how sports teams works you with them to the very bitter end you're loyal but with politics we need to stop being like that if our if our political peers are doing something harmful or are simply wrong we need to be unafraid to be like no I'm not going to be part of this I'm going to I don't want to I don't, I don't agree I need to sort of stand up to our to our to our friends most of all mm -hmm. and it's very difficult when politics are woven into our communities into our friendship groups into our jobs into our sense of self-worth into our identity it's very difficult to change what you believe when it's very much part of who you are mm -hmm. and uh, it's a very dangerous dangerous place to be in well and it's a very volatile subject it seems uh mm. these days more than ever before mm. sadly yeah yeah more mm -hmm. so than ever i'd say Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, yeah, I did, you know, check out your Instagram account and I, I read through a lot of your posts and stuff. I didn't really find anything that was, I'm using air quotes here now, offensive, controversial. Mm. A lot of what you're posting, you're posting statistics. Yeah. You're everything that you're posting, you have, you know, the the facts to support it it's not that you're just spewing stuff that has absolutely no no validity to it mm. yeah no well that's that's a massive benefit to me um i mean i when i arrived in this space a few years ago i was blown away by how much amazing data and information research there was around the various issues so i mean i talk about homelessness i talk about uh, the prison population i talk about mental health and suicide I talk about domestic and sexual violence i talk about fatherlessness and i was just like there was so much interesting data that no one's got the guts to share but i'll do it <laughs> why, why not me i'll I'll put it out there as long as the data is reputable and as long as i can show that uh, and give like citations i have no problem sharing it like there's nothing controversial about facts and reality sometimes it's hard to read but that doesn't make it wrong and, it, and that's another another phenomenon I've noticed is that people are more interested in what feels good mm -hmm. um, than what was actually objectively true. And it's mm -hmm. a lot of it is about looking good rather than doing good and like looking good in front of your friends and your peers or having these very popular, uh, fashionable political opinions. But whether those opinions do good is a very different matter. And you're right. I mean, I, I don't mind being unpopular. I don't mind being a villain as long as the information I'm providing is reputable, up-to-date and expansive. And it is. And if people don't like that, that is not my problem. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I don't mind. I mean, I'm happy to be cascaded or vilified or whatever else. Yeah. If they don't like it, it says more about them than it does about you. It does. And yeah. I want to just say thank you for just stepping up to the plate and taking responsibility for that and having yeah. the courage to do so. Well, that's all right. I mean, it's at least it shows authenticity because, I mean, in this space of being an influencer when you get to about 10,000 followers you start to get brand deals and you get people giving you money and can you sh can you share this can you sell this product can you give away a product and I'm way past that but I've never had any brand deals I've never had any sponsors I've never given no one really gives me any money no one sort of advertises on my content which is you know a bit disappointing but at the same time it means I can say whatever I want it means I can be authentic I'm not there's no sort of hidden agenda here like everything I post is what I believe and what I found to be true I'm not trying to sneak in some sort of product placement or <laughs> brand deal or something and I hope that brings a, an additional level of authenticity 
on top of what you've mentioned about the sourcing and using of reliable data. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So now I just want to go back and ask you, George, when did you decide that you wanted to step up to the plate, take that mantle and to start sharing information? What was the catalyst that said to you, okay, now's the time and, and you need to do this? Um, I think there were lots of different experiences where the very thing we just spoke about, where I'm, I'm willing to, you know, face some condemnation for sharing what is true. A lot of people were not doing that. A lot of people were just sort of showboating or virtue signaling or just saying the things that sound great and they weren't actually true or they weren't the complete truth. And I was like, there's a whole side of gender equality that no one's willing to talk about but impacts me and all the men in my life and all the people that are important to me and half the world's population are not being spoken about in a way that I felt was authentic or just simply not good enough. Um, and I've always been an advocate for women and girls, but I never truly understood what men and boys are going through until I started reading about it. And then of seeing that and my, my innate sense of an annoyingly high sense of self-righteousness, that sort of combined with my skills as a creative, uh, I've got quite a wide set of creative skills so i can i can design i can animate i can create films i can write quite well i was like well i have all these creative skills there are all these important issues that no one's talking about and we're going for sort of coronavirus and lockdown at the time so i had a defiant element meaning time and i just put them together and they combined quite well with my personality type which is as we discussed i don't really care what people think about me will only care about what i think of me and as long as i'm proud of what i do that's good enough so those different elements came together and what the outcome was, the Tin Men, and mm -hmm. what once what was like basically a library of content that is as as you know entertaining and informative and reliable and inclusive, but I didn't want it to be apologetic and you know vibrant and bright and creative and at times funny, and I just what I just I assume I guess in a simple way I just I wanted to be what was missing from the conversation, and that is a, a journey I'll be on for the rest of my life. I don't think I'm quite there yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to be part of a solution, a better, a better conversation for men and boys. And I hope I've gone some way of doing that. Mm -hmm. And it's been really good fun. So how did you come up with the name, The Tin Men? I'm curious about uh, that. Well, I mean, ideally, I'd give uh, my, my handle would be my name. But as discussed, using my name is not particularly wise because it just, it just it don't want to give away too much personal information. So I needed a pseudonym. And uh, I, I really liked the idea of the Tin Men from um, The Wizard of Oz. So those are unfamiliar. Wizard of Oz is a story about these characters that are trying to get to the Emerald City. And on that journey is the Tin Man. And the Tin Man is on a story. His story is trying to find his heart because he's, he's a Tin Man. He doesn't have a heart. And then at the end of the story, he realizes he had a heart the whole time. And I was like, that's a really nice parallel story for what I see as the male experience where men are con constantly told that they're, you know, you know, um, they don't have a heart. They don't know how to feel. They don't know how to express themselves. They're sort of made of stone. And I'm like, that's just not true. Like men do have hearts and men do have feelings and they're important, just as important as women. But are we looking deep enough? And I feel like I have a heart. The men in my life are all have hearts. And I was like, my, the mission of my page is to remind people of that, Most, mostly men themselves. And uh, that's how the name came to be. Mm -hmm. I love it. This is the second time, actually, in a period of, I think, less than two weeks where somebody has made a reference to The Wizard of Oz. So I'm <laughs> really kind of loving that. Thank you. Well, who's the other one, if, my, if I may ask? Not the other man, one was a woman, um, can't remember her name right off the top Dor of my head. She was just Dorothy. like three. No, no. Uh, it was one of my guests. She was, it was about three episodes ago. And she was talking about how she had to step back into her power after a lifetime of being pretty much a doormat. And wow. she said that, and I asked her her last words that she wanted to share before we signed off. And she said that her favorite quote of all times came from the Glinda, the good witch, okay. when she said to Dorothy, my dear, you've always had the power. You just needed to learn it for yourself. Yeah, very similar to story to what I spoke about. Like, it's, and I do, I do, I do genuinely feel. I say it again, I do. Men do have hearts. Men do know how to mm -hmm. express themselves, and they do know how to feel. It's just isn't 
exactly the same as how women do these things. And we need to learn as a society to see the value and hearts of men and their feet and understand the, their feelings and how to express themselves and, mm -hmm. and their needs. That's like work we all need to do, I think. There was another post. Um, it was something about, let me see. Well, it, it you were asking, you know, about, or something about women say that they mm. need men to share their feelings with them or, you know, encourage them. Yeah. And then sometimes they actually get, when the men do mm. share their feelings, you get a variety Recognized. of different reactions. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, the, the popular trope is men can talk. And I do want to use this opportunity to say men, men should talk. And it is important that men do express themselves more as much as they can or feel comfortable doing. But I also wanted to ask people that followed me, my community, like what has actually happened to you when you did share, when you did open up? Like we always encourage men to open up and be vulnerable. But a lot of the men choose not to be vulnerable for the, the reason that when they were vulnerable last time, they were hurt. And when mm -hmm. they shared to someone they trusted, they they then turned it around to hurt them. Like the stories of one man said he, he shared things and then uh, his partner use that to justify an affair or another one sort of one person said it was like a, squir a squirrel squirreling away nuts for the winter and when an argument happened later in that year all the things that he he mentioned to her it was used as a weapon and he was like this is these are things i told you and i trusted you and now you're what, turning them to weapons to use against me but there were loads obviously there were mostly stories of men saying my wife and girlfriend fiance are amazing and they were very supportive and having shared we've actually gotten closer and they also understand what I'm going through. One of the things that uh, is important about men talking is not necessarily about just them being heard, but people hearing what they're saying and actually understanding what they're going through. Because if men aren't talking, we don't know what they is experiencing. Um, we don't know what men aren't telling us, in other words. Mm -hmm. So it's important for everyone else that men share. Mm -hmm. So we appreciate their experience. But there's, yeah, I guess that post in particular was a it was the other side of the coin about what happens when men do share. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of stories of men being harmed or betrayed, let down. Uh, a lot of women just finding them less attractive or just wow. like just breaking up with them. And like, it's down. That's why I feel like it's not just down to men to talk. It's about us to give them the space where they're not judged and certainly not punished for it. And that is not a conversation I see happening very often. Wow. So now you mentioned your community. A community mm. of men that you you have uh, are these like followers followers of yours are they friends of yours are they just people that you know from you know online uh how tell me about that and how how you guys communicate with each other is it mm. do you have a platform that's you know open forum type of thing yeah i mean I, I, it's a community i built online the funny thing is my my real life friends and my on my online friends and following are not really the same because I don't share my content in my real life because mm -hmm. I just know it's not particularly popular. I know it'll probably lead to more arguments and more more friends lost. It's very difficult to have them divided. So I don't really talk about this to my real life friends. And then obviously I have to manage that of a parallel existence of being quite an influential voice in a very, so it's like splitting, you'd call it. So I'm, I'm basically playing George and the Tin Men. And it's very difficult to reconcile those two things together. And it comes at quite an emotional cost sometimes. It's quite exhausting and upsetting. But to answer your question, I guess one of the important things I want to say is that I have a huge, um, huge group of women that follow me. About a quarter of my following are women. So tens of thousands of women. And I'd say, I'd say they are some of the fiercest and most protective of me. So whenever one of these little trolls strolls into my page, it won't be a, an army of angry men that come after you it would be a, a, a even bigger army of pissed off women like it's mm. amazing it's amazing and people get really disorientated like why are all these women following you oh my god and um yeah my my following i say my following are my friends and there's an amazing community and some really really interesting dialogue happening in the comments very like i know one person and the, the post i put up today about saying how women 90 percent of the innovation of in language historically has come from women. Like women are, when I say women are the innovators of language, I mean that in the most literal sense mm -hmm. that they, most of the new words we have in English are from women. Mm -hmm. And then one person was like, that's total crap. No, I don't believe it. And I was like, Fabian, who's my friend in Germany, who's a member of the community studying this very thing. I was like, hit us with some knowledge. And he comes in with this amazing text of research and citations. So I like, I mean, I, 
I really want to share the credit for my page of those other people in the comments because the con the posts are great, sure, but if you scroll down to the comments, I'd say it's even better. The conversations that I I am trying to stimulate and encourage are very very exciting and worth coming just for that. I think, but yeah, my, I love my following and my friends. I absolutely love the fact that uh, you had a whole uh, you know. <laughs> Uh, army, let's just say, of women. Yeah. You know, and yeah, I think that uh, a big, big group of totally pissed off women is mm. far more frightening than yes. a, the same <laughs> amount of men who are pissed yeah. off because yeah. we know things. Yeah. And women are just better campaigners, I find. Like, mm -hmm. there's one thing you can learn from feminism, although I no longer consider myself a feminist. I've always been amazed by how organized and militant and pissed off they are and how effective they can be. And I'm like, what like, what an inspiration, what a role model to set for all of us. That like, women are amazing campaigners, like truly more organized, more hardworking in that sense. And I feel like men need to like we need to organize like they have. And like I it'd be crazy of me not to harness that sort of mm -hmm. womanly power. <laughs> and right. yeah, they're there. And I'm very proud of them. And I'm I'm glad. And it's I think whenever people say this is a page of misogynists, I'm like, well, then what, why are there 15,000 women following me then? Like, what? Mm -hmm. how is that possible? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, in my martial art, uh, I was told once I started training, and of course, if you knew my story, I did not go willingly into martial arts. It's a very long <laughs> story. I got dragged into it, kicking and screaming and not in a good way. Uh, but the funny thing was that uh, once I started training and I started to take it seriously, the men would always walk by me and whisper this word, kunichi. And I thought, ooh, what's that? It sounds a little dirty. And the, the, they explained that it was actually the female warrior in Japanese. Wow. Is That's what she was called because the female warriors were the ones who were the most feared because they were mm. so fierce. Because they had, they looked harmless. They looked helpless. They looked, you know, feminine, delicate. And, you know, they were able to infiltrate behind the enemy lines. And then it was like game over. Well, yeah, I mean, as we discussed about, I'd rather not be bullied by a woman or girl. I'd rather also not come up against a female samurai or someone such as yourself for that very reason. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's no, no shame in accepting how the, the strength of women and mm -hmm. how they can be amazingly fierce. And I mean, I've seen it firsthand and I get I get messages every day from such women, like, especially from mothers especially mothers of boys a lot mm -hmm. of a lot of women message me that oh, i'm a boy mom i've got two boys or three boys so I messaged me four boys today and she was just like i found your page it's amazing i can't believe how much you've changed my mind and really opened up my perspectives of what my boys are going through and the real dangers that they're going to face both now and later mm -hmm. in life and uh I, yeah i'm very proud of the women that follow me and i'm honored if anything there is a woman that I follow. I used to listen to her radio talk show every single day. She's actually out of outside of uh, Pittsburgh, or she's based in Pittsburgh, which is where I'm from originally, a small steel town outside of Pittsburgh, mm. which is why I live in Denver now. And uh, she has five boys. Wow. So yeah. raising five boys in this type of environment, I mean, she was very authentic and real with some of the stories mm. and everything. And it was just really fascinating, uh, you know, to hear. And I, I always wondered, how do you raise a boy in this society with mm. so much negativity and so much, it's so demeaning and disrespectful mm. and marginalizing to be a boy or a man? Mm. Yeah. And, and, and I'm just... a woman and I'm saying <laughs> that. Well, I mean, even even just in objective terms, like if you think about something like, let's take education, which is mm -hmm. education is not just about being educated. Education is, it helps in every single possible way you could imagine. Like someone that's educated is more like, more likely to live longer, have better health, be happier, more likely to be married, more likely to earn more higher amounts of money. Like education is, is like a common denominator for everything good in life, essentially. My sister has a daughter, Anderson, and I was talking about the, my page and she doesn't like it particularly much either. And I was like, you should know that boy who's your son is 75% less likely to go to university than that girl. 75% less likely. And I was just like, that is just a statistical fact. And it's getting worse. It might even go higher than that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, it shouldn't be right that a boy is 75% less likely to go to university than a girl when you consider how much of an advantage it is. And I mean, just sticking to education, like boys are not only behind in the UK, but they're behind in every stage of education in virtually every single developed country in the world. It's a massive problem. 
And if you were to speak to someone on the street, who's behind education, I would say 90% of people would say girls. Girls are the one that disadvantaged, disadvantaged which is just simply not true. Not true anymore, at least. Yeah. And now the pendulum swung. And um, sorry, that's a big old tangent. But my point is that there are, there are significant disadvantages faced by boys and men. And I'm glad that so many women and mothers message me having learned these things and hopefully maybe change mm-hmm. change the way they, they see the world as a consequence. It's so amazing how the pendulum has swung so far to the other side. Yeah. Because like I said, I'm a baby boomer. So I remember, you know, mm. I was pretty young, but in the 60s, I remember this, you know, women's lib and all this mm. burn, ban, ban the bra or burn the bra and all that kind of stuff. And it was, you know, we didn't really pay that much attention to it. You know, I, my dad was an immigrant from Eastern Europe and, you know, we just, you know, we were raised pretty, I don't want to say really strict, but definitely, yeah, we weren't going to be burning our bras. Let's just put it to you that way. (laughs) Actually, at the time, none of us really needed one, but to, to see what happened from that you know, at first it was like, okay, women are going into the workforce a little bit more. Women are, mm. you know, don't have as traditional of a role as they used to. But then it turned to be something that just got like, like this, it, it, like a snowball rolling down a hill, mm. getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and running other people over. Mm. Yeah. I mean, education is exactly, the pendulum swinging is the perfect way to put it because like you said, in the early 70s, America brought in Title IX, which I'm sure you know is basically a, le- a legal framework that there can be there can be no discrimination in universities and women should mm-hmm. have equal access to education as men. Mm-hmm. And there's really no one that could possibly argue that is a, a bad thing. It's a wonderful thing. That started in 1973, I believe. By 1981, we were at parity. So that 1981, less than 10 years later, which is an amazing success rate, we were at parity. So equal numbers of women and men going to universities in America. And that's sort of where we should have stopped, but we didn't, we never stopped. And now we've continued and it's mm-hmm. crossed over or the pendulum has swung. And now the fact of the matter is that boys and men are further behind in education in America now than women and girls were in the seventies. So it's actually worse. It's swung even further. And there was no political will. There was no conversation to change that or even admit to it. And it's kind of terrifying. And I, I feel like that's why these conversations are so important. So we can have, we can do the work that our politicians are not doing and mm-hmm. we can raise awareness where there need there really needs to be more light shone in the matter and we need to update our perspective of sexism and understand that it's men and boys that are facing structural sexism within education systemic sexism discrimination within higher education mm-hmm. just like women did 50 years ago and we need to be uh, need to fight it with the same bravery and commitment as we did back then maybe and about the bra may- burning though if, if I may be so bold, I do believe that we could do it so much better than the politicians do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I've got very little faith in politics. I mean, I, I kind of, uh, it's just been an absolute roller coaster of disappointment in the UK. <laughs> like the last five or six years is absolutely incredible yeah. how incompetent they are. It's yeah. horrifying. They don't, I, I gen, my most, I don't even think it's that pessimistic, but I genuinely feel that politicians don't care about us. All they care about is getting votes and they'll they'll appeal to whoever votes the most and whoever votes the most is women. Women in America are, have had greater democratic power, electoral power than men for 40 consecutive years. Mm-hmm. Like women in America can pretty much choose whoever goes into whichever office anywhere in, a, anywhere in the country every single year. And they, they swing elections all on their own. And again, that's another place where men should learn from women and be like, go vote because you're not going to get any sort of change unless you vote, because politicians are only interested in themselves. And uh, that's it, really. Boy, I could say something really controversial right now, but I guess I can because it's my show. Um, And I heard this, it was probably a couple of weeks ago, that, and it was kind of put out there as a joke, but it was another radio show that I, I or a streaming um, program that I follow. And they said, you know, they asked, would women give up the vote? The vote? And of course, women just got outraged. Like, Are you kidding me? We mm. would never give up the, the vote. And then the host gave some statistics about, you know, how women vote and how they, you know, their choices. And then a couple of women, a bunch of women called back in and said, in that case, yes, I would give it up. And I thought, I mean, whoa, this is this is just mind bog- boggling. 
I always find it, I mean, I think everyone should have the vote, um, obviously including women. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting how typically the the right to vote for men is tied to their responsibility to serve. So in America, of course, men and boys have to sign up for selective service at age 18 and make themselves available for the military draft. But only men and boys, not women. Um, and it's interesting how the other half of rights is also responsibility. Like rights and responsibility coming hand in hand in the UK when men won the votes. And people, this is another thing, people just do not believe me or do not know. And is that that is 100 years ago. Up until 1919, the majority of men couldn't vote either. Women couldn't vote and most men also couldn't vote. And it was only because of the war, the First World War, that in 1919, working class men got the vote. And it was because of their service and their sacrifice in the trenches. The horrors that cannot even be imagined that they were given the right to vote, and quite rightly so, and women got the vote too. And I was just like, often the vote comes at a huge cost and responsibility. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, and I'm thankful I don't have to pay it. Mm-hmm. And you're right about the responsibility. I I don't think sometimes that people really consider the consequences of mm. their vote. It's it's almost like I'm voting against this person and I don't care what the other one stands for. I just don't want this person. Yeah, and if you would I mean... look at their record and look what they've, you know, really been how they've been voting, if they have at all, you might want to do more research and look at, into it before you decide who to vote for. I'm just saying. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you you're not exactly spoiled for choice over there. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a bit of a I mean, it's hard, it's hardly even better than what we've got. Uh, and it's just like I don't understand how how these are the best of us. Like, how is that? How are you, the prime minister or the president? Like, how are you the very best of mm-hmm. America or Great Britain? Like, it's just embarrassing. It doesn't make any mm-hmm. sense, and it's just leading to a complete mess. And uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I I also fundamentally feel like we need to stop expecting so much of government because A, they're incompetent, B, they don't care. Mm-hmm. And we need to put more weight and responsibility on ourselves as communities yeah. and individuals to, to be the change ourselves. Because if we're waiting for our politicians to solve the issues I talk about, like male suicide, we're going to be waiting for a long time. And I feel like we need to take personal responsibility to take on, to tackle those problems and have these conversations and listen to them. Uh, well, ourselves. I'm glad you brought that up because we hear about it all the time from our politicians, you know, that we need to address this and we need to fix this and this is a mm. problem and we need to start taking steps. And they're saying the exact same things they've said for over 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And it's almost mm. like they're bringing up the same rhetoric, the same talking points. And now's the time to get the work done. Well, where the heck have you been the past 40 years? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, our, our politicians are still blaming the, the previous party who are in power, and they were being out of power for like 13 years. And I'm like, when are you going to take responsibility? You can't just constantly right. blame the last guy. It's just like embarrassing, really, really yes. embarrassing. Yeah. yeah. And it's stupid. I have one question for you, because it's something, it's a word I had never seen before, and I got this off of uh, one of your Instagram posts too. What are the incels? <laughs> incels? An incel is that's a stands for involuntary celibate. So it's a oh. person, typically a man, who uh, wants to have a sexual relationship with a woman, and for one reason or another is unable to. Uh, it's an in, that's an incel. But more specific to that, an incel is a self-identified term for uh, typically a man. It's not just any man that can't have sex is an incel. It's an incel is something that self self-defined. Um, and it's often seen, and it is, it's a large growing problem of disenfranchised men who spend a lot of time online, who are very, very lonely, not just sexually disenfranchised, but mm-hmm. they, they struggle to find work, they struggle to make friends, they struggle to find a partner, they don't really fit in. And they've been sort of, um, in, in it's sort of the flip side of the, the man bashing we talk about, where these are the men that have been pushed away, ostracized, radicalized, and taken advantage of and exploited by nefarious men other men uh just basically um brainwash them and it's just like it's oh. like a difficult it's about either about 60 to 100 thousand of these men in america right now wow and it's, and it's it's very sad and it's it's really sad to see how frequently they're vilified by people online when really we should be trying to understand who they are and give them treatment like try and bring them back because otherwise we're just pushing them further and further away 
and it's it's a very hot topic a bit of a catchphrase right now and it's very disappointing but ultimately mm -hmm. it's a group of very depressed very lonely very anxious men with a huge overrepresentation of autism for example like autism has quite similar similar sort of um symptoms and i mean i think something like I think 0.6 of the world's population are autistic on the autistic spectrum disorder, but about 18% of incels are autistic. So it's about 30 times higher than the general population. So it's just a massive mental health crisis that people are not willing to talk about. Or if we do talk about it, we talk about it in a very cartoonish way that is typical of men and men's issues where we just see it as a problem to be mm -hmm. extinguished. But yeah, an incel, involuntary celibate. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'm just hanging around the right crowd or the wrong crowd or whatever but it seems to me that there is starting to there's this movement that's starting to i don't want to say gain momentum but it's starting to get a little bit of a, a toehold on men's mental health and of course that's mm. how i was introduced to you through a mutual friend who's mm. you know whose focus is on men's mental health but i'm seeing it a lot more in uh, the podcast community there are a mm. lot more men who are standing up speaking out which is, I think, really hard for them to do. I, you know, I really applaud their efforts for having the courage to be able to stand up and say, hey, now, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. And there's a reason why we're having some of the high suicide rates and the high divorce rates and the depression mm. and the homelessness. You know, I see it around town. The, around town. I'm All of the people I see standing on the street corners are men. And it's just heartbreaking. And I know a lot of people say it's by choice, maybe, but some of the some of the other reason could be just from circumstance that they can't they can't find a way to get themselves back. But yeah, very I mean, very complicated. I mean, so many different things to talk about there. But I mean, just sticking with homelessness. I think you mentioned earlier you live in Denver, mm -hmm. and there's an interesting pro interesting program that Denver launched last year to help homeless people. And it's basically about giving homeless people universal basic income where they would give homeless people a certain amount of money to go live a life and go rent a house and go you know, make friends and buy clothes and have a shower. And they never gave it to men. That program is not available to homeless men. And I was like, but the, the vast majority of homeless people in Denver are men. And it was women, non-binary people and trans women that got it. And I was like, well, what about men? I was like, how could you possibly have a program for homelessness in Den in Denver, which I'm afraid to say is where you're from, and not and not target the group most at risk? They should be front and center in Denver's fight against homelessness. So, I mean, that, that explains a lot about why there are so many men, homeless men in everywhere, in the UK, America, everywhere, because we don't care about them. We, we see them as less worthy, more disposable and you know, there's loads of things talked about mental health and relationship breakdown, divorces, and suicide, and they're all very disparate problems and they all require individual delineated conversations around each of them. And it's Well, I difficult. have to tell you, I moved to Denver 44 years ago. Was it 44? Going on 45. Mm. Soon. <laughs> and it was a completely different place. Mm. And you never saw homelessness. You never saw, you know, the trash on the streets. You never saw any of this stuff. And it was a very well-run city. It was actually quite lovely. And over the years, especially I'd say maybe the past four or five years, things have gone to hell in a handbasket. Mm. So that does not surprise me. It's almost like um, nobody wants to really address the root cause of the problem, look at mental health issues, try mm. and get help for people, try and make that as accessible. But here, take this money and do with it what you will, but only people who fit a certain yeah. you know, qualifications well, people can have this impacted. money. I mean, it's my money. It's my tax money. Let me help you know get a vote in where you put it. Mm. I would just say give it to homeless people, not a specific yeah. group within the homeless. Right. And certainly, certainly don't exclude the group most at risk to homelessness. It doesn't make it, it makes no sense. There's another example I can think of top of my head in New York. There was a shelter, New York city spent $9 million building a shelter for 200 homeless men, which is great. And then the, the, the locals found out and they picketed and protested, threatened legal action against the city of New York. And then they, they changed the shelter to not sheltering any homeless men and sheltering exclusively homeless women. And like the Senator came out and said, this is, not ideal, but we're happy that a far greater outcome has been achieved. And I'm like, what? Like, how could you? 
like it doesn't make any sort of sense to me like why you would refuse to shelter homeless men in new york but then you turn a men's shelter into a women's shelter again like 70 or 80 percent of homeless people in, Amer- in new york are men and it's like they they should be the primary recipient of such help um really everyone all homeless people should be helped and um that's not just that doesn't exist as homelessness we there's such a thing as male disposability where we just see men as less deserving of help or support than women across the board and that's that's, that's, that's in all the issues i talk about uh but we're just obviously talking about homelessness as an example mm. well i have to tell you i really applaud your efforts and everything that you're doing to help bring you know, this subject to light and help hmm. educate people who are willing to listen. And I think that you are making a big impact just by how many women that you do have following you. And those women have friends, those women know men. And just, I think through persistence, I really believe that the tide is going to change again. And I think I that this so. can be a, a conversation that a lot more people are going to have. And just what I said with uh, some of the guests that I have talked to on my show, that there does seem to be a little bit more focus on men's mental health and what has caused some of the mental health issues mm. and how we can, as a small community, not just have the government fix our problems, because mm. we all know how well that works, uh, just... <laughs> take care of our own communities, our own household, our own neighborhood, then our community. Uh, it, it can grow in a way that's very positive and in an organic way, rather than wanting somebody else to fix the problem. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I guess I, I hope that's a good takeaway of our conversations that people listening, like we don't, like you said, we don't need to wait for some sort of mm-hmm. amazing government intervention. Like we can go right now and start looking after each other and including men and you can ask men how they're doing and take care of them and actually listen to what they tell you and encourage them to be a bit more vulnerable and not use that vulnerability for your own means of uh, your own sort of advantage and like we there's nothing stopping us from right now to start showing a little bit more compassion and understanding of men give them a bit more space including boys and like mm-hmm. no politician's ever going to do that for you mm-hmm. and no amount of money will solve that problem mm-hmm. well george how can people get a hold of you how can they follow you and say nice uh, things about you Oh, I mean, you don't, you don't have to say nice things. I mean, as long as whatever you say to me or about me is constructive, I don't mm. expect it to be all nice. I welcome all people to my page, even people that disagree with me. I, mean, I often find the most constructive conversations I've ever had are with people that disagree with me. Um, but to answer your question, I'm on Instagram primarily. So my tag is at the tin men. So T H E T I N M E N, uh, all one word. And I mean, I, I have Twitter and Discord and a few other things, but primarily because it's just me, I only have time to do one, and that mm-hmm. is Instagram. Yeah, I think I have seen you on Twitter. Yeah, I know I'm causing a bit of a nuisance everywhere, I'm afraid, but mostly <laughs> I'm a troublemaker on Instagram. For the time if being. you're not a nuisance or becoming a nuisance, then you're not making a difference. Well, it's like Che Guevara said, he said, a uh, sad thing not to have friends, but worse not to have enemies. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, there's truth to that. I feel like you're not rattling the birdcage enough if everyone's nodding along and agreeing. And I'm right. My mum, my mum always taught me to sort of throw stones at convention and rock the boat and be a bit of a, my dad too, actually, to be fair, he was always a troublemaker. So mm-hmm. there's no shame in it. As long as the conversations are, you know, in good faith and respectful. Mm-hmm. And constructive. Yeah. 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 Constructive. Do you have any final pearls of wisdom that you want to leave with the audience before we sign off? Um, yeah, I mean, I just think in general, we expect men to be this, to be able to solve their own problems. And unfortunately, they can't, not all the time. And like it is not just down to men to solve this problem, like male suicide, for example, it's not just down to them talking or, or crying. It's about us actually listening to what they're saying and or listening to how they communicate and doing the work ourselves as a society to actually see men for who they are. And they're not exactly the same as women. Often they show distress in different ways. Often they communicate in different ways. Often they need different type of support. And that's okay. And the answers to those questions start with listening to men. <laughs> like listening to men. And it's strange how often the conversation about men's mental health and male suicide is sort of gatekept by people that aren't men. And I, was, <laughs> I want to return the conversation of men's mental health and male suicide in particular to men. And that's part of all of our responsibility. Not just for men to talk but for us as a society to um, listen, ask, and act. And uh, I'd say those three words, listen, ask, and act. 
that's what I feel like everyone can do starting from right now to help men. Oh, excellent. That's wonderful. And I think even more than the listening, there's a difference between listening and really hearing somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And like, also I went just in terms of like how to listen to someone. Often it's great to, when they're telling you something, you respond to like, are you looking for someone just to hear you and feel validated? Or are you looking for a solution? Often I find men off too often give solutions when they're listening. Sometimes women in general want to be heard. Men more in general want, want solutions to their problems. So I often find to work out which one the person wants. It's like, do you want a solution to the problem or do you just want to be heard? Mm. And that's sort of the ground zero of listening, in my, in my opinion. <laughs> Very nice. Well, George, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. I have been looking forward to this conversation ever since we made that date. So it's been yeah, great having yeah. you on the show. Yeah, well, thanks, thanks for having me. And next time we'll have a little play around of those katanas and you can show me some of your amazing uh, katana samurai skills. And yeah, looking forward I to it. I do have some skills. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. <laughs> anyway, thanks for having me. And uh, it's been great talking to you. And everybody, thank you so much for listening. And see, this wasn't so painful, was it? It was no. actually a very informative episode. And please do share it with all of your friends, you know, it's, it's your women friends, your male friends. Uh, I just think it's a really important conversation to have that we shouldn't be cutting out men from our lives. We shouldn't be diminishing or marginalizing anybody. We should be supporting and uplifting everyone. And I think that by sharing our stories and talking like this and having great conversations, we can achieve that. And remember to listen, ask, and act. And that is the way of the Feminine Ninja. <laughs>